So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all again for joining us today's webinar, Mentoring Children and Youth Affected by Opioid Misuse and Substance Abuse. This webinar is brought to you by the National Mentoring Resource Center. Again, my name is William Moore. I am with uh, OJJDP's National Training and Technical Assistance Center. And as your technical host, I would like to take just a couple of minutes to discuss a few features of the Adobe Connect webinar platform and provide a few announcements to keep in mind. Please note that this event is being recorded and will be published on OJJDP Intact's YouTube page. The webinar recording will be archived in approximately one week on OJJDP's Intact's YouTube page where you can also view past webinars. And for the event or receiving a transcript or even any type of supporting materials, please contact OJJDP INTAC at OJJDP TTA Help Desk. For those wishing to download a copy of the PowerPoint slides and other important documents, you may do so by locating the handouts pod directly above the chat area. Here you will also find an FAQ for webinar participants that will likely address any technical related questions. Click on the file name and then click the download button. At the end of today's webinar, there will be a Q&A session where the presenters will address some of the questions posed during the presentation. Please type your questions into the chat box as they arise. For those participating in today's webinar as a group, please take a minute to help us count. Go to the chat window and type in the total number of additional people in the room with you today. If you are viewing alone, there is no need to type anything into the chat pod at this time. And I'll just give folks a couple of minutes to do so. Remember, if you are viewing alone, there is no reason to type anything to the chat pod. Just please type the additional number of people in the room with you today. Following today's webinar, attendees will be sent a certificate of attendance. This certificate is sent approximately one hour following the conclusion of the event and is sent via an Adobe Connect thank you email. Please keep an eye out for your email for this certificate. And finally, at the conclusion of this webinar, you'll also receive a link to a brief survey about today's presentation. The feedback you provide is used to assist in future planning and training. I will now turn today's webinar over to our moderator, Elizabeth Santiago, for today's webinar. Thank you, William. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Elizabeth Santiago. You see my information up there. Um, another thing that's not listed is that I am the director of the National Mentoring Resource Center. And I'm going to set the stage for today. I'll be very brief because I'd like to kick it over to our incredible panelists. Um, so if you can go to the next slide. Here's our presenters for today. Um, we've had a last minute unexpected change. So Hannah Granfield won't be joining us today. Instead, Rebecca Bean will be joining in her place. Um, and as you can see, we've got a wide range of panelists here for you today. Um, so why don't we just go ahead and get started. Um, the National Mentoring Resource Center, right up here, and you'll see, is a is funded a program by um, funded by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. And so our website, which is not here, is the National Mentoring Resource Center org. But if you have uh, questions, you can always send us an email at nmrc at uh, mentoring org, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, and so I wanted to just start us off with a brief landscape. This is going to be very brief because we have a very meaty program for you today. Um, but there's been a spotlight on opioid abuse and misuse over the last few years because misuse of opioids is on the rise. And our panelists are going to talk about what's currently happening in their regions during this presentation. But 
it's important to note that many communities have been struggling with substance abuse for decades, and some communities have looked toward mentoring to support young people impacted by substance abuse and youth in their families and, and communities. However, today, the research on using mentoring to prevent substance abuse or substance use initiation or to prevent abuse once it's started is a bit mixed. The most comprehensive examination of this comes from a systematic review of mentoring to prevent or reduce alcohol and drug use by adolescents. The link um, is here on the screen, and you'll have access to these slides later so you can look at this uh, review. But they examined the impact of mentoring on alcohol and drug use across six separate evaluations. Four of the six studies showed some impact on reducing alcohol use. However, none of these impacts were really uh, statistically significant. The two of the studies were able to be combined, and those two considered together did show a statistically significant impact on reducing alcohol use. Um, the second link here is a blog post that was written by our Director of Research and Evaluation uh, for the National Mentoring Resource Center, Mike Geringer, The Promise and Potential of Mentors in Combating the Opioid Crisis. And it has some really good insights and thoughts. Um, but you know, we, as we start to get to know a little bit more about what the research is saying and uh, where mentoring can, can play a role, we need to have more research, and we need to have a little bit more of an understanding of the role mentoring can play in opioid um, and substance abuse prevention and uh, use. Um, but there has been considerable effort in the mentoring field to provide mentoring to children of incarcerated parents, for example, um, or children um, or youth in foster care. And uh, the links to which uh, you'll find here on the screen, there are links to reviews that we put on our National Mentoring Resource Center that talks about these populations and the role mentoring can play. So mentors appear to have a positive impact on youth behavior, relationships, educational success, and emotional well-being. This, of course, speaks to addressing the effects of substance use and misuse, and hopefully prevention of initiation by children of youth. Um, children and youth. So let's go to the next slide. So mentoring can play a role in prevention. Mentors can be most helpful on the front end by supporting the healthy development of young people and helping to prevent the initiation of opioid use. I think the strongest argument for using mentoring to prevent substance use in youth comes from the things we know mentoring has an impact on, like the things listed here, self-esteem, decision-making, hopefulness for the future, life satisfaction. Um, mentoring has shown to be impactful in all of these areas, and theoretically, each would play a role in helping a young person avoid initiation of drug use or limit harm once it has started. We just haven't found the link definitively yet in the research, but we're working on it. Uh, Rebecca Bean, our first panelist, will speak to this a little bit more. But before we get to her, let me just spend a minute describing what we're planning uh, with the NMRC um, starting in October. So we're figuring out the tools and supports around our approach uh, to providing more information on mentoring for youth impacted by substance abuse or, mis or misuse. So the first thing we are going to do is a deeper literature review. We're going to really look at what the research is saying and the role that mentoring can play. So that's on the horizon. We also are working on targeted technical assistance which will include helping programs figure out what the needs of communities are, because the needs of each community is different. You'll be hearing from Rebecca Vian and Liza Boritz, who are at the Gover Governor's Prevention Partnership in Connecticut, and Ken Merrifield, who is part of the Appalachia Mentoring Project. And they'll speak about the needs of their particular communities. RPA providers will support programs in figuring out their needs, specifically um, in their regions. So we also know that um, children with four or more adverse childhood experiences are more likely to use alcohol or report use of illegal drugs um, and other things as well. So we're going to be really looking at the, the role trauma-informed mentoring will play in, in helping to eradicate, um, if I could be so lofty, this crisis. Um, so those are some of the things that are on the horizon uh, for the National Mentoring Resource Center. 
And now I'm ready to turn it over to our panelists so they can get into the meat of this um, webinar for you today. So our first panelist is Rebecca, and I will turn it over to her, to her right now. Thanks, Elizabeth. Good afternoon. Um, as Elizabeth and William mentioned, Hannah Granfield, who was um, originally slated to present this portion, is unavailable to do so today, so I am stepping in for her. Uh, my name is Rebecca Bean. I am the Program Manager for Training and Technical Assistance at the Governor's Prevention Partnership here in Connecticut. Um, and I would love to talk a little bit more with you about um, how mentoring uh, supports young people who are affected by um, opioid use and misuse. So the, the whole idea is that it promotes the overall health and well, wellness of individuals and communities by delaying or preventing substance abuse. And we do that by way of um, several avenues. Those include um, information dissemination, education, alternative activities, strengthening communities, promoting positive values, problem identification, and referral, source, referral to other services in the young person's community. The goal then uh, is that mentoring can change attitudes and behaviors that contribute to alcohol and other drug abuse, which can lead to healthier outcomes. We know with mentoring that influ influential and positive adults that are consistently involved in young people's lives um, will help them um, and help with positive and successful outcomes. But if a young person is affected in some way by opioid use or misuse, um, and a positive caring adult who can speak to them directly about these issues on a regular basis can decrease the rate of use and abuse. And therefore, mentoring a young person um, can also serve as a prevention measure. The quality and duration of the mentoring will affect the likelihood of positive outcomes, and that's something that we see with mentoring across the board, regardless of the population of youth being served. Increased mentor training, intensive mentoring, and support of that match um, will be best practice towards match retention and positive outcomes. And if programs are aligned closely with the elements of effective practice for mentoring, um, there will be a positive outcome and effect on the match relationship. Um, a meaningful relationship between a mentor and a mentee um, is perhaps not news to some of you, um, is marked by a trusted and mutual regard and understanding um, between a, an adult and a young person. So how, uh, continued how the mentoring supports the youth. What do mentees need when we're talking about uh, youth who have um, are affected by opioid use or misuse. Um, what we normally do when we're supporting youth, we offer that support, the guidance, the skills. But we need to add some things on when we're talking about young people who are affected by opioids. Um, and most of the mentee orientations and trainings don't talk to this. So we encourage that programs will um, consider including more things like support groups for the young people, um, more training for the young people, right at the beginning of the, the mentoring relationship. Um, and right at intake and orientation. Additionally, uh, mentors who are working with children and youth um, who have, are exposed to opioid use and misuse um, will need to have specific skills and knowledge to that target population. So potentially a degree or certification in substance abuse prevention or treatment is preferred, but certainly not required. The screening process for these mentors could look identical to current practices um, as following um, the elements of effective practice for mentoring. The training then, though, can be increased. So um, including what is typically um, offered in pre-match training, but also adding some enhancements in pre-match and in ongoing training and post-match. And some of those things could include um, post-traumatic stress, disability bias and inclusion, trauma-informed mentoring, youth empowerment, crisis management, um, and the list goes on. I imagine that um, several folks already have um, certain post-match trainings, but certainly enhancing those would be really important. Mentors we would look at as more of a, um, a skilled, intensive mentor for these young people. Um, if youth enter a treatment facility or some sort of extended um, service, the hope is that the mentor, because they are skilled and engaged, will will likely remain connected with that mentee and continue support of that mentee through um, their treatment. 
When we talk about supporting youth, we also have to talk about engaging and supporting families. So we want to encourage folks to have increased training opportunities for families and caregivers beyond what is offered in the initial orientation and training. So some of those things could include positive parenting, effective communication strategies, restorative and relationship building, adolescent development, substance abuse, youth, and prevention. Um, engaging families and making referrals also is really important to supporting the youth in a mentoring relationship. Um, considering a framework that takes into account cultural factors, um, considering individuals in a person's life that they constitute as family, um, and engaging those folks to also be active supports and natural connections for the young people. We want to mobilize those, those positive adults for them in their circle. Uh, encourage the continued interventions that families are engaged in um, throughout the mentoring relationship will help with that engagement. Even after the formal mentoring relationship has ended, the hope is that mentors stay connected and programs perhaps stay connected with the families beyond. Mentoring program staff and mentors should join the family um, in a way of building the relationship with those, especially those long-standing system-involved families um, in a way to establish trust and confidence. If all families are feeling welcome, all families that the young person has identified as families, the youth is more likely to engage in a mentoring relationship that will be successful. We have to understand that there will be some resistance um, from those families that are involved in a young person's life. But the best, the, the, if we can acknowledge that um, and accept that and learn how to um, work closely with that family, um, it will be kind of a natural response and, and request um, for change for the family. Um, so I will turn it over now to my colleague, Liza Boris, who will talk more about um, the opioid use and, and define that a little bit further for you. Thank you. Um, so, yes, so my name is Liza Boritz. I'm the Director of Prevention Services here at the Governor's Prevention Partnership. Um, I'm going to provide a little bit of a, um, a broader context for opioids prevention and mentoring. Um, so there's been a lot of attention, as we've already mentioned a couple of times, there's been growing attention on um, the opioid use disorders, also referred to as OUDs. Um, opioid use disorders and related opioid um, deaths. A lot of uh, program managers and communities, funders especially, um, are all asking the question how we can um, provide prevention services to young people during this time of the opioid crisis. Um, but before we can answer that, um, there's some context that we need um, to consider to be able to um, uh, to have effective conversations around how youth are impacted and how we can effectively mentor youth who are impacted by the opioid epidemic. So one of the first uh, questions we need to ponder is, um, what is the context? So um, in, according to CDC data, in 2017 in the United States, 15.5% um, of adults over the age of 18 were daily smokers. Um, a little bit less than 8% of high schoolers reported smoking regularly. On a national level, nearly 500,000 people died last year from smoking-related issues. 56% of adults over the age of 18 reported that they drank in the last month, and over 88,000 people died from alcohol-related deaths in the last year. And these numbers are fairly consistent on an annual basis. And then you look at the um, number of the population, the percent of the population that meets the criteria for an opioid use disorder, and you see that it's, it's less than 1%. It's actually just less. It's 0.9% of the population meets the criteria for an opioid use disorder. So oftentimes, um, especially for those of us in prevention, it leads us to ask the question, since this is not the most highly used drug, why is this considered the current crisis? So let's look at youth in addition, in youth use. And um, these numbers are related to uh, uh, high schoolers. So in 2015, which was the most updated data set that I had, um, 
thirty three percent of high schoolers drank alcohol in the month prior to taking the survey. Um, thirty nine percent of high schoolers reported lifetime marijuana use, and five percent reported using prescription pain medication for non-medical use, um, and opioid, opioids as well is a very low number. So again, it, it begs the question, why is opioid, why is it the opioid crisis? Why aren't we talking about um, a marijuana crisis or an alcohol crisis or a tobacco and nicotine crisis? So some of that information can be seen in the numbers of um, opioid-related deaths throughout the country. This is national data, um, and the national data is available on CDC, and you can um, look at it. You can look at it in terms of state-level data as well. Um, but when what you look at the, when you look at the trends of the national data, um, if you look back at 2002, there were just over 20,000 um, people who died as a relate of uh, as sorry, <laughs> who died from opioid-related deaths. Um, and when you look at 2017, the estimated number is um, uh, 72,000, over 72,000. So you can see there's been such a dramatic increase of opioid-related deaths over the last few, few years. Another important um, point to mention is that um, the opioid-related deaths are, uh, sorry, I, sorry, I lost my point here on my slide. Um, so what you see is that opioid-related deaths occur at a higher rate than any other illegal substance. A higher percentage of the population uses um, cocaine, for example. However, the number of people who um, experience opioid-related overdose and opioid-related death is double the number of people who experience cocaine-related deaths. So what we see is that um, while it's not the most highly used substance nationally, it's one of the most lethal. And I think that's where we begin to understand that this is a crisis. And when we put that in context for the young people that we work with, what does this mean for our mentoring relationships? Well, it means, for the most part, our young people are not the ones who are directly impacted by, opioid, by their own opioid use disorder. The vast majority of opioid use disorders occurs between um, the ages of 30 and 65. So young people are not very likely to be using um, non-prescription opio non prescription opioids or a prescription opioid not intended for their use. But loved ones are at a higher likely for using, and those who are using are, at, an are much, at a much increased risk for a fatality as a result of that opioid use disorder. And I believe that's why nationally we look at the information and we understand that this is a crisis um, because of the mortality and morbidity is so high. And I believe at this point I'm passing over the microphone to Ken Merrifield. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I appreciate you all uh, coming in and listening to this. Pfizer did some uh, incredible information there. And the things that we're going to see in Appalachia bear out uh, what she was talking about. So we see uh, the high overdose rates as well as the destruction on the family unit as being some of the major issues with the opioid crisis in Appalachia. A couple of things on a lighter note, and this is, there's a reason that I, I start with this slide. It says, in 1934, cheeseburgers were the first tasted in Kaylin's restaurant in Louisville. When we think about Appalachia, we're thinking about something that is very specific to a region. It's a mono-industrial region, it's, uh, which has similarities to the steel industry in the Midwest, the copper industry in the Northwest. What happens when an industry that is a mono industry goes down, the whole culture begins to ask questions about worth. Some of the drug abuse that takes place later on comes out of that. So as I speak about Appalachia, oftentimes people from Appalachia will ask me to remind everybody that there are some really great things happening there. Now the reason that I'm familiar with 
is a rural region called the Tri-State Region, which is on this map, if you look at the blue word Cumberland, right where Virginia, Tennessee, and Kentucky come together. That's right there, that region is where I'll be speaking about. In Kentucky, this information comes from the Kids Count data. You can find that if you look at the Kentucky Youth Association. And uh, this is a Annie Casey Foundation supported data. It's very good. We find that Kentucky ranked top in children under age 18 that were placed in out-of-home care. Roughly about 7% of the statewide are in some type of kinship care. Usually that's with grandparents. And so we see that the problem uh, in this particular region, however, is affecting both uh, the elderly as well as the children. 41% of Kentucky children are living in high poverty areas, $25,000 annual income or less, and 12% live in deep poverty. Now in the southeast corner in Bell County where I work primarily, we see that there's also a lot of educational hindrances, with 38% only being kindergarten ready, while only 50% in the state of Kentucky are kindergarten ready when they enter in. It's also ranked second in proportion of children who are overweight or obese, with a BMI of greater than or equal to 85%. Now this slide shows uh, basically the only hospital where there was labor and delivery in Bell County, Kentucky, is Middlesboro Appalachia Regional Hospital. And they put together a community health needs assessment each year. And based on the 2016 report, which is public, it talks about one of the impacts that they're seeing in the particular region is the need for drug rehabilitation. And so their goal as a hospital is to provide drug rehabilitation to the 65% of mothers delivering at Middlesboro Hospital. So you can imagine that the issues that we are seeing and the numbers that we're seeing now in this region are going to be multiplied on their effect of children when 65% of the mothers who are giving birth in the only hospital with labor and delivery are testing positive for illegal drug use, primarily, primarily opioid use. So their solution at the hospital was to get a DA certified physician to prescribe Suboxone to pregnant women to help with the fetal withdrawal. As Liza brought up, the severity of the issue with the opioids is not so much with the quantity of use, which is tremendous in rural Appalachia but it's with the overdose ratios that follow the use of these drugs. The two top counties are counties where we're starting mentoring programs currently. So Leslie County, 68 per 100,000 is the top overdose uh, county in the state, and Bell County, where we lived and worked, is 61.2, ranking second in the state. Now, uh, this is some information that uh, just talks about the, the part of the solution is when we think about, this is out of Steve Corbett's book, uh, How Do We Help Without Hurting in Areas of Poverty? And you see, what he's trying to do is he's trying to talk about in these high poverty areas, there are many aspects to poverty. We often think about poverty in terms of conditional or material poverty, but in what he calls generational poverty, in other words, areas that have had poverty for multiple generations, you see the effects on the culture being much larger than just conditional poverty. But as you see in Bell County and rural Appalachia, there's also academic poverty. Uh, there are, we've already mentioned, poverty of what he calls poverty of being, which is adverse childhood experiences of all kinds and sorts. And then there are forms of relational poverty. We see this in the mountains in rural Appalachia all the time, where the children are growing up in homes where their only context is the context of drug abuse of many different types. 
and everybody that they know and their whole social or uh, relational network is made up of people that are of that similar background. And then there is the moral poverty that often comes alongside. So as you're thinking about developing programs, one of the reasons that mentoring can be a good solution or can be at least a part of the solution for these areas where there's this generational poverty is because it's dealing with all, it touches on all five aspects of what we see in a context like rural Appalachia. So when we compare a child or a youth with a, an adult that's kind of got a very healthy situation, then it's been shown through some, some papers out of Princeton and Harvard, it's been shown that if a child who has had various ACEs can just unload some of the stress from those adverse childhood experiences on one healthy adult that they trust, that it can make a significant difference in their life. And a mentor can give, uh, can increase the social capital of a child significantly as well. This is a, a, a slide that I, I put together from Charles Cooley, an old soci sociologist of 100 years ago. But he brings up in his works a couple of things that I, I think are important for us as, as you begin to, to work on helping to find solutions for communities that are suffering with this opioid crisis. And he basically brought up the fact that it takes a village to raise a child. And somehow we know this inherently. So we, we know that some decades ago, oftentimes uh, people in different neighborhoods knew what the kids were doing. And now we're living in more isolated uh, neighborhoods. And so he was bringing up the fact that for a child to be raised in a healthy manner, it often takes the adults in the neighborhood. It takes the school system working. It takes healthy families. Take healthy peers and even church activities of different sorts. So as I think about how do we see and help these communities, again, one of the ways that mentoring can play a role, and as you, as you put together your program and you think about this, what we found in Kentucky at least, and that is a fairly conservative area of the United States, certainly. But what we found is as we start mentoring programs in various cities or various towns, that, that all of these different sectors of the culture have something in common. They all care about children. And so as we begin to talk about mentoring children, what, it, what happens over the long haul is that it brings entire towns and sectors of the community that typically don't work together they begin to function together and work together. So it's a good way of, of engendering community involvement. So here's some ideas for new mentoring initiatives. If some of you would like to start some of these, start younger and stay longer is one. We're finding that these children, even before they get into kindergarten, are already suffering the effects when their parents are drug users. And so if you can think in terms of, I think in the past we've thought mostly in terms of youth, in terms of for mentoring. So at least in Appalachia, we are beginning our mentoring programs now with reading buddies and school systems at second grade. And we're trying to link these children all the way through college with uh, mentors. Also, we should be thinking about multi-generational programs especially in Kentucky, where 7% of the kids are placed with grandparents. We're, we're, we're trying to think through how can we do programming that would provide mentors for children, but also mentors for the grandparents who are raising those children, as well as if there is a parent that is in place, how can we help that one? And so I have to talk, talk a little bit about that as well, thinking in terms of family groups. I was watching a CBS News documentation on, on this called Grandparents Raising Grandkids Amid Opioid Epidemics. That was out of Utah, and that's uh, there for you as well to look at. Also, we're thinking about linking programs. So when we come into a community and, and 
look at developing a mentoring program in a community. The first question we're asking is, what is already working on behalf of children and youth in that community? And how can mentoring play a, an important part in linking up with what already is happening? So for instance, Kentucky has the Year Up program, which is school-based mentoring. Typically, this is taking place in the junior high level. So on our school-based programs, we try to link up with the, the Gear Up coaches and so that we could provide mentors that would, that would start in the elementary ages and then join the school system in the seventh and eighth grade all the way through the beginning of the first year of college. So those are some ideas. I just close out with this quote. The informal mentoring gap is substantial in elementary schools and steadily increases as children age through middle school and into high school. And as things stand now, formal mentoring barely begins to close the gap. The total class gap in mentoring in formal plus formal begins in elementary school and balloons just as the kids most need help in their families. So in sum, nearly two-thirds of affluent kids have some mentoring beyond their extended family, while nearly two-thirds of poorer kids do not. And this stunning gap exists not because the poor kids don't want mentoring. In fact, they are nearly twice as likely as the rich kids to say that at some point in their lives they wanted a mentor but didn't have one. So that was written by Robert D. Putnam in The American Dream in Crisis. So that just closes my part out with um, emphasizing the fact that especially in some of these poor rural counties, it's important, I think, for us to begin to, to really work and develop mentoring programs on behalf of kids. Thank you so much, Ken. Uh, thank you also, Rebecca and Liza, for sharing um, such important information. Uh, so I um, encourage all of our participants to ask any and all questions. The panelists are ready for you. We have a couple of questions coming in. And I saw earlier that people were having trouble hearing me, so I hope that this is better. Um, but please do let me know if you need me to speak more uh, loudly or get closer to the phone. Um, the first question is, I'm going to start, I'm going to ask this question of Rebecca, um, and then we'll ask, um, you know, Ken to respond as well. But um, do you have specific suggestions for effective parent and youth engagement activities for mentor programs working with substance abuse treatment facilities for those youth impacted by opioids? Um, so I'll start with Rebecca and, and Ken. If you want to uh, chime in, that would be great. So this is Liza. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna oh, start to answer that question. <laughs> That's okay. So um, so from our perspective, I think the first most important element is making sure that um, before there's any consideration of family engagement, it's to make sure that the mentors are not just culturally competent, but um, culturally have cultural humility and are able to um, engage with parents in relevant ways. Um, and that takes a lot of work on the part of mentoring coordinators and it takes a lot of work on the part of the mentors themselves. Um, and what you find is when you're um, doing that work, those answers will come to you because the families will help co-create what activities they want to engage in with you. So. Um, so we could give lit running lists of varying types of activities, but the most important thing is for um, you and your mentors to be um, very receptive and to understand equity and to understand um, systemic oppression and systemic poverty and how that um, impacts families and young people and um, how that is a barrier for family engagement in a lot of different um, domain. So, um, so I think the most important thing, I'll just keep reiterating, is that we, um, we make sure that we're cultural, um, at a bare minimum, culturally competent and working towards cultural humility uh, and then um, engaging with families with that lens and that perspective. Yeah, I would agree with that. In fact, uh, 
I would say the same thing. Uh, our, our first and foremost emphasis when we're starting mentoring programs is how do we help the children and the youth. That was just our particular uh, approach. Um, we're still developing really programming for uh, second generation for grandparents. And we're at the beginning stages of that. But the way that we're doing that is we're actually giving a, a second mentor for the mom or the dad or who, whoever. And uh, our, our main focus is that first and foremost, those relationships are built in a culturally appropriate way, as Liza was, was saying. And once those are built, then the activities themselves will come up naturally. And it's just, it's basically just spending time together and doing things that we enjoy together. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Liza. Um, here's another question for both of you. Um, the, uh, you guys had both listed some really great data um, around the, the success of mentoring to some extent or to the, the role of um, uh, mentoring in, in this crisis. And I wonder if you had any other suggestions for other data sets um, or places where folks can look to get more uh, information. So the CDC has a lot of data um, available, as does the, um, the National Institutes of Health. You can find, um, I think in the presentation, and a couple of my slides have some links in them um, that can connect you to CDC data sources that you can interact with um, and you can get a better understanding of the um, issue in as it presents in your, in your area. There's the youth risk behavior surveillance system. That is going to tell you what the youth use rate is in your communities. There's the National Survey of Drug Use and Health. Um, that can give you information on what um, substance use issues and other health issues are prevalent in your, um, in your area. And I think all of those data sources can be um, sorted. So you can look, I think, um, statewide and even sorry, countywide, um, depending on which survey tool you're, use, you're, um, you're looking at, which results you're looking at. Yeah, and the only other thing I would um, add to that is that when we're starting new programs, uh, we just go in and we do interviews. Sometimes we, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at all the data and we're getting all the numbers, but we found it very helpful simply to go in uh, for example, we were, we were starting a mentoring program in a, in a high school, a local high school, and so we just went in and uh, got permission to talk with the teenagers and began to put together a survey. It was a survey that was approved by the school system, and we, we asked them questions. We asked them what was going on in their lives, what kinds of problems they had, and what was important to them, and it was quite surprising, and some of the things that they, that they said were important. Um, at, at one point, you know, they were just looking for a safe place to go. And so that helps us then to build a mentoring program that's safe and effective, but also helps them to achieve some of the goals that they've stated. Perfect. Thank you. Um, uh, this is an interesting question, but uh, do you guys know of any ongoing curriculum that will support mentoring over the long term, over a decade, say, from grade school? through college. Um, this is interesting for us uh, from the NMRC perspective because we are going to do what we're calling a listening tour and get a sense of the needs. And we may develop something like this if we find that that is a strong need. But if there's something already in existence, um, we'd love to hear about it if anyone knows of anything. But um, Ken, Liza, or Rebecca, if you know of any uh, curriculum like that, or it, are there things that you specifically use um, over a long period of time? Yeah, Liz, this is Rebecca. Um, I don't, I don't know. I'm not familiar with any real curriculum. I know in the programs that I work closely with here in Connecticut that um, we really encourage, um, and this follows kind of the elements, and encourage um, programs and mentors to really have the conversations with their youth about the mentoring relationship the formal mentoring relationship ending, um, and then what happens beyond that, and encouraging those, those mentors to be committed to the young person for the long term. Um, so I don't know a specific curriculum, but I know that 
having the kind of the closure conversations um, throughout very important transitions in the mentoring relationship is key to sustaining the mentoring relationship long term. Yeah, Elizabeth, I would I would say um, we we don't have a a curriculum, and I don't know of one. I I heard when I was at the the mentoring summit that you all were talking and thinking about that, and I I think it would be helpful. It's it's a little bit difficult since every region is so different. We partnered with Peter Vanacore and C A Y M, and they have tremendous amount of training online with videos and that is that's kind of mapped out the curriculum for us and in most of the programs that we're using and uh, like Rebecca said it also had videos for every important juncture like the the interviews for safety uh, and going into it as well as the exit interviews and so that's been very helpful and that can be found at CAYM.org Great. Um, yeah, this is an interesting question that has, has, has been posed. Um, it says, what if anything is different about opioid use um, than other substances that would warrant adaptations to programming? Um, you know, I, I'm not sure about that. That's really interesting. I'd be, I'm curious as to what you guys think about that question. Well, one of the things that I mentioned in, in one of my slides, and this is, this is Liza, um, is that um, what's a little bit different is that for the most part we're talking about indirect exposure to an opioid use disorder. Um, the, the vast majority, um, especially when you look at your local data, it might fluctuate a little bit, but even nationally, of the 73,000 overdoses last year, um, less than 1% were um, under the age of 18. When, it, when you're looking at opioid use disorders. So, um, and in Connecticut, we've, we've had very, very few. So what we're looking at is the ways in which young people are indirectly connected um, and indirectly impacted to opioid use disorders. Um, and it, and it, it does happen. It's not a, a zero percent of young people are, are using opioids, but um, we are looking at communities who are experiencing opioid use um, at a higher rate in um, uh, and you know adults using which is causing some impacts on on the young people in the community yeah I don't Elizabeth I don't have anything more to say on that I, it, it's a great question uh, in the region that I that I'm working in in Appalachia it's just uh, opioids are just the primary abuse and the the overdose rates are so high that it's it's caused everybody to to focus on that particular one in that particular region and that so that's kind of kind of the deal but I don't I don't know that it would be that way in other regions and it's also it's uh, it's very it's very severe when um, so when you look back at the data and you see that um, you know, almost 500,000 people die annually from smoking-related oh, okay. um, from smoking-related issues. Um, that is that's a long-term problem. There are many avenues for intervention, um, and there are many opportunities for intervention and treatment. Um, whereas with opioids, it's such it it can often be a very shortened time frame. So the the speed that you have to get somebody from um, an intervention into treatment if they have an opioid use disorder is so compressed um, to prevent anything from happening. So it's, a, it's oftentimes a very dramatic um, and intense experience as opposed to some of the other substance use issues which are much more durational and, and can be an experience that's experienced by a young person over many years. Not to say that any one is easier or better than the other, but just to say that um, there is much uh, urgency around an opioid use disorder that doesn't necessarily exist to the same extent around some other substances. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question about what the screening process is for children entering mentoring programs. Rebecca, maybe you could speak to that? 
Yeah, sure. Um, so I think it's um, specific to the mentoring program. Um, so most of the programs have some certain criteria for young people to be um, involved in the program. The referral sources can only come from certain um, places or the, the youth um, that are being served are only in elementary school or middle school or high school. So I think it's specific to um, organizations and the mentoring program, but I think um, that programs have to be really individualized about who they have, who, what mentees they have, and that they really accept any referrals that come their way, um, and then screen from there beyond that if the young person is for some reason not going to be an appropriate fit. That doesn't mean that the program has written them off right away. Um, they still try to engage and connect and um, interview and intake that young person um, to see if they are a good fit for the program and for a mentor. So I think it's um, the short answer is that it's individualized um, and based on the funding or based on the program um, really determines the, which kids are referred to the program and then the screening process beyond that. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, I don't know if this is related. There's a, uh, another question about um, within mentoring programs, do you look to hire people with lived experiences? Um, I'm interested in reaching out to our local colleges to utilize students in mentoring youth and teens. Um, I, I kind of read this as almost a credible messenger uh, type of mentor um, or someone who works in a program that maybe has experienced something similar um, to the young person. Um, and I don't know if um, anyone, uh, one of the panelists can speak to that um, or things that you might have seen that were successful. Um, I will um, answer. Um, yeah, I agree, Elizabeth, that it is um, kind of, it, to me, read it as this whole credible messaging um, type of mentor. And I think for our young people in um, identified populations, um, specifically perhaps juvenile justice or um, substance abuse or um, child protective services. A lot of our kids, if we are matching them with young, with positive caring adults with best intentions, if they have no experience um, that is alike what our young people have, then they are less likely to connect potentially. Um, but with training and support, I think it can absolutely work. Um, I oversee some, some programs that recruit mentors from places like colleges and local universities, but also encourage um, mentors that are that are like our young people in our program to become mentors. And there's certainly the screening and the background checks and the training that all has to still go in with that. Um, but if the programs have really written um, and outlined criteria um, and, um, and exclusionary criteria for mentors, I think those with lived experiences um, will help make the best mentors for our young people, especially in um, really specific populations of youth. Yes, great. Agreed. Um, Ken, I don't know if you, you have anything more to add, but I can move on to the next question. Well, the, yeah, in our, in our programs, uh, we, we found that recruiting from colleges has actually been difficult for us, and there are a lot of positive things, if you can do that, uh, that have already been mentioned, because there's just a quick connection, and um, they're of the same or similar background and age, and they understand things. So that, that's, that's all very, very good. We're really trying to pair, and found it very important, um, in Kentucky at least, for us to try to pair these mentors to stay with these kids uh, for multiple years. And so the schools that are close to us in Bell County are primarily their graduate schools. Uh, we have LMU there as well as some others, but because of that, oftentimes the students are coming in, they make great mentors, but they're only in the region for a couple of years, and then they're gone for the most part. And so that's been the downside for us as we try to develop mentoring programs. And, uh, and so it's, it's, it's a work in progress for us trying to figure that all, that all out on our end. All right, thank you all. Um, so we have about three minutes left in the, the webinar, so I don't think we're going to have enough time for final questions, but this has been a rich, rich discussion, and I appreciate all of your time, um, and I'm going to turn it over to William to wrap us up. 
Fantastic. Thank you very much. And thank you all to all of our participants on today's webinar. I just have just a few more items that I would like to remind folks about just to wrap up today's uh, presentation. And so just to remind everyone, you can contact OJJDP Intact through the website displayed on this slide. And you can stay up to date on the latest information by signing up for OJJDP Intact's TTA Listserv. Also, don't forget to check us out on Facebook at OJJDP TTA. You can also contact OJJDP via the help desk following the contact information on this slide. And as a reminder to everyone, the webinar recording will be archived in about a week on OJJDP's Intact's YouTube channel. And supporting resources can be obtained by contacting OJJDP's help desk at OJJDPTTA at USDOJ.gov. If everyone could please take a moment to review the disclaimer on this slide. And lastly, we would appreciate if you all would take about five minutes to complete the feedback survey. Again, thank you all for joining us today. Have a great afternoon.